Shipwreck at the Bottom of the World, The Extraordinary True Story of Shackleton and the Endurance by Jennifer Armstrong. Chapter 3, The Growlers. As Endurance steamed down the River Thames toward the sea, however, World War I boiled up in Europe. Great Britain was preparing to join the war against Germany. Shackleton had no choice but to telegraph the Admiralty and place the entire ship, crew, and stores at the Royal Navy's disposal. Two military members of the crew immediately resigned from the expedition to rejoin their regiments. Shackleton and the rest of the men on board Endurance were tortured by indecision. They were all patriotic subjects of a country heading into war, and yet they all now burned to voyage south. They waited anxiously for word of their fate. At last, Winston Churchill, who was first Lord of the Admiralty, Admiralty at the time, sent a telegram. Proceed. On August 8th, the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition left England behind with mixed emotions and crew watched England's shores slip away. On the eye of Britain's entry into war, every man knew he was leaving his country at a critical time and would be all out of contact for at least a year and a half. But they set sail nevertheless. They would There would be no turning back. As Shackleton wrote home in a telegram, we are leaving now to carry on our white warfare. By October, they were in Buenos Aires, on the coast of Argentina, where there was some shuffling of the crew. A few of the original members were discharged for drunkenness, and replacements were hired on the spot. Argentine sightseers crowded the docks to see the world-famous explorers and showered the crew with invitations to dinners, dances, and cabarets. A motley pack of 69 half-wild sled dogs from Canada was brought on board. Not a single member of the crew had any experience of driving a dog team, but that wasn't the sort of detail to worry about with, or sorry, worry the confident Shackleton. The dogs were housed in kennels built on deck, where they snapped and lunged at anyone who passed too close. The Argentine naval band played the British and Argentine national anthems with an accompan- accompaniment of barking, growling, snarling, and howling from the dogs as Endurance set sail on the next leg of the voyage. It was October 26, 1914. Unbeknownst to the commander, the ship carried an additional newcomer. A young sailor named Percy Blackborrow was hiding in a locker, aided by William Back- Bakewell, another young seaman. Once the ship was three days out from Buenos Aires and there was no chance of returning, Blackborrow was brought forward to face a furious commander. As Mrs. Chippy the cat rubbed against Shackleton's legs, the commander looked the stowaway up and down. Do you know that on these expeditions we often get very hungry, and if there is a stowaway available, he is the first to be eaten? He warned, ignoring the cat purring at his feet. The picture and caption on page 11, Percy Blackborrow, the stowaway with Mrs. Chippy, who was actually a tomcat. After Blackborrow was brought before the boss, he was made the ship's steward. Page 12, Blackborrow was not dismayed. They get a lot more meat off you, sir. Shackleton turned away to hide a grin and told Frank Wilde to turn the lad over to the bosun, but added, introduce him to the the cook first. The crew was somewhat in awe of their commander, whom they all called Boss. As Dr. James McElroy said, Shackleton could be a very frightening kind of individual, like Napoleon. He was very stern-looking and fixed you with with a steenly eye. In the months that followed, they would learn to follow him almost without question. Shackleton was a master at keeping his crew working together. Whenever he found two men who had quarreled and were not speaking to each other, he told them, stop and forget it and made them shake hands. He never let them forget that their strength lay in unity. Because seasons are reversed in the southern hemisphere, spring was well underway as the coast of South America slipped away to the northwest. Endurance headed for South Georgia Island, 
one of the sub subantarctic islands on the edge of the Antarctic Convergence. The Convergence, also called the Polar Front, is where frigid, oxygen-rich water from the south, cold water holds more oxygen than warm water, mixes with warmer water from the north, causing a thermal swap of slow churning in the water that pulls nutrients up from the ocean floor. This shifting front of rich ocean about 25 miles wide, is the most fertile ecosystem in the world, supporting awesome numbers of fish, seabirds, seas, and seals, and whales. Whaling first brought people to South Georgia Island, and it was to a whaling station that Endurance headed as its final stop before challenging the Antarctic. Greitviken was a Norwegian outpost on Stromness Bay, a natural harbor at the base of the island's rugged alpine cliffs and ha- Uh, glaciers. Snow squalls and heavy seas made visibility poor and forced endurance to creep forward with the engines dead slow as it headed into Stromness Bay. A whaling boat was spotted in the fog and endurance gave two blasts with its whistle. Immediately the Sitka came alongside endurance and with a whale carcass acting as a bumper between the two vessels in the heavy waves piloted the ship into Greid Greidviken. Endurance landed at South Georgia Island on November 5th, three months after leaving England. The whaling station was a rough spot with the carcasses of blue and humpback whales putrefying in the midnight sun and the harbor red with blood and shimmering with grease around the oil factory. Billowing clouds of steam rose from the plant where blubber had been boiled down. According to Harry McNeish, the ship's Scottish carpenter, ye could snuff the aroma if ye were five miles out to winterd. The crew soon gave the harbor the sarcastic name, the scent bottle. From the mountainsides echoed the harsh donkey bray of Jean Two penguins, the screech of skuas, and the bellowing of elephant seals. When endurance docked at Greivikin, the Canadian wolf dogs were let off to gorge themselves on whale meat, and they added there the caption and picture on page 13. Greivikin Whaling Station on South Georgia Island. The whaling station employed approximately 200 men of different nationalities. Almost most of them were Norwegian. Tons of whale meat, bone, and scrap blubber lay rotting around the station. Page 14. Barking and snarling to the tin that echoed the din that echoed from the Alps of the Southern Ocean. The Norwegian whalers were the only source of information about current conditions in the Antarctic, and the news they had for Shackleton was bad. The ice pack surrounding the continent had been particularly heavy that year, and it wasn't breaking up as quickly as usual. None of the experienced whalers could remember ever seeing the pack so far north. A bad year for ice was the terse description Shackleton heard over and over. Although he had planned to stay in Greivikin only a short while, the boss decided to wait one or two weeks longer for the warmer weather to break up the ice. Meanwhile, the crew made the most of their time ashore. Hurley was fearless in scaling the cliffs around the harbor in pursuit of great photographs, and he had to lug around a large box camera to do it. Some of the men practicing skiing because they were so far north, the sun shone around the clock, and the crew was resourceful in finding entertainment. There were practical jokes, including one on Herbert Hudson, the navigator, who was generally considered an oddball and sitting ducks for jokes. Told there was a costume party ashore, Hudson was proceeded to dress in a bedsheet with the teapot lid tied to his tied with ribbons to his head. In this bizarre getup, Hudson made a grand entrance into the party of the whaling station, only to find himself the sole person in costume. From then on, Hudson was nicknamed Buddha. In all, Endurance spent a month in Greivikin. Each day of delay meant putting the expedition in jeopardy, however. If Shackleton did not reach the edge of the continent before the end of the short Antarctic summer, the ice would shut him out. On the advice of the whalers, Shackleton had the decks of the Endurance loaded with extra coal for ramming through the ice. Then, on December 5th, a little more than two weeks before Midsummer's Day, Endurance set sail from Greivikin. Huge 
dripping slabs of bloody whale meat meant for dog food hung from the rigging out of the reach of animals. Behind them, the whale factory blasted its whistle and saluted the ship with rounds of harpoon gunfire. Endurance was on its way to the frozen continent. Only three days later, they met their first ice, large chunks called growlers that scraped and rumbled past the sides of the ship. The Norwegians had been, the picture and caption on page 14, a blue whale being flinched at Greivikim. The whalers strip the carcass of blubber and boil it down into oil. According to Hussey, the harbor had a most appalling stench from the dead whales moored in the harbor awaiting flensing. In the caption and picture on page 15, Bull elephant seals on South Georgia Island. Meteorologist Leonard Hussey described the noise that sleeping elephant seals make as suggestive of a nightmare or a guilty conscience. The inspirations of the, of the breath are irregular gasp. The expirations, or expirations tre, tremendous wheezes. The body shakes violently from time to time, and the four flippers are ever nervously moving about. Page 16. The Norwegians had been right. The ice had never been this far so far, this seen this far so north. There were, they were still 600 miles from the nearest coastline and hadn't even crossed the Antarctic Circle. Yet ahead of the south in the Weddell Sea, brilliant blue icebergs shone in the polar sun like the walls and ramparts of a fortress. The caption and picture on page 16. A view of the interior of South Georgia Island, the Alps of the Southern Ocean. When the crew landed here, no one had ever tried climbing across the forbidden mount, forbidding mountains and glaciers. The figure in the foreground is Worsley.